Have you heard the good news? God loves you and so do I. So do I. Scripture comes from Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through verse 33. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. The subject today, are you a sheep or a goat? Now, my old church, the pastor would have you to touch three people and tell them, are you a sheep or a goat? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you to just touch two people. This scripture is talking about the judgment. At some point, this will all be over. All the pain that you've felt, all the things that you've gone through, this temporary passage, this journey that we call life will be over. And we get to face eternity. And God will stand before us on that great throne in the final judgment. And he will separate us. He will separate the sheep from the goats. Gathering the sheep to his right and the goats to his left. And we have to ask ourselves, while we're down here, are we, are we sheep or are we goats? Because if you ask a person, they will say, I'm a sheep. Of course I'm a sheep. But God doesn't look at what we say. God looks at what we do. It's not our words that God hears. God hears the heartbeat that beats for those that are struggling and those that are suffering. Amen. In Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and in Revelation, it talks about these times. Satan was an archangel in heaven. He was one of the highest positions, the closest to God. In fact, Satan led praise and worship and music. And when you get that close to, to somebody in top position, at some point you believe that you can do what they can do. And Satan believed in his heart that he would exalt himself above God, that he would make himself God. And he was so cunning, he was able to convince one third of the host of heaven to join him in this revolt. But Satan lost that battle and he and his angels were thrown down from heaven to the earth. And that's where we pick up Genesis chapter number one. This creation. Now how did Satan convince these angels and all the hosts of heaven to join him? The same way that you convince anyone. He believes that God was not going to be God, that he would be God. In fact, we'll all be God. And let's create our universe on our terms. Let's write it our way. We don't have to adhere to God's rules. We'll make our own rules. And he begins to discredit God and make them believe that God really is not God. He's not sovereign and that we don't have to believe the word of God. And the same lie that he's told in the beginning, he's still telling us now that you don't have to believe all the word of God. Take what you believe. Take a little bit of this. Take a little bit of that. And let's just create our own belief when the word of God is clearly written to those who would believe. Let's look at our outline. There's some outlines that I gave you. I'm going to go through that. Number one in our outline in your program. God will separate his obedient followers from pretenders and unbelievers. Pretenders and unbelievers. I text a lot of friends and, and uh, there were some that are not believers. And I text them anyway. I'm going to share. I'm going to share. I love this one. I, I text and say, look, come to service today because I believe God gave me a message. And here's one of my favorites. It wasn't one of yours. Say, come to church today. I invited him here. He says, ain't happening today, son. You know it's football Sunday. And my bears are on the local channel. So are you ready for some football? <laughs> I know I am. So have a good sermon today. I'll see you when I see you. <laughs> I love that. True. 
The Bible says, be hot or be cold. Let your yes be yes or your no be no. One thing I'm not good at is lukewarm people. People that are part way in with you and part way out. Either you in or you out. Either we're going or you're not going. Let me know where you're going to stand. And God is asking you, where are you going to stand? Are you in or are you out? Because when it comes to the judgment, you won't have to give any excuses. You know, when we grow up, we finally get it. We recognize that it really wasn't ever about us. It was never about me. When I came to that revelation, it wasn't really about me. That God created me with purpose and a plan. And this plan wasn't so that I can do me. This plan was so that I can make this world a better place. So that when I would leave here, someone would be glad that I was here. Something changed as a result of the work that God gave me to do. That the assignment that God gave me to do, I completed that assignment. That's how the world has changed, one heart at a time. And if we sit back, somebody else will do it, but someone else will get you a blessing. You watch someone else walk away with what God had for you because we do not want to get involved. Look at verse number 34. The king will say to those on his right hand, come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God has prepared a place for us. Even before you were born, God knew you. And before you were formed in your mother's womb, God had a place carved out for you on this world. And God says, before you were born, that you would be blessed. In Deuteronomy, he talks about that. If you carefully observe all things I've commanded you, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed in the country. You'll be blessed going out and blessed coming in. You will be the top and not the bottom. You will be above and not beneath. You will be a lender and not a borrower. You will be the head and not the tail. That you will be blessed, but your children will be blessed, and your children's children will be blessed. Why? Because of the blessing that falls on you. Some of you may not know that what's happening with you has nothing to do with you. There was somebody that went before you, that prayed for you. And you're receiving the blessings of somebody else that loved God. And when they love God, the favor of God rests now upon you. And now we choose to reject God because we think that God has no bearing on our situation. God made your situation. And everything that's about you that's working, you can thank God for it. It's not because you're so smart. It's not because you met the right people. It's not your degree. It's not your connection. It's that somebody had a connection with God that allows you to be in this place where you are. You could have been dead. Some of you were that close. But God spared you so that you can now make a difference. So that you can take what God has given you and what God has done for you and that you can now pass it on to somebody else. And what God gives you when God takes you out of the married clay is a testimony. You may not know scripture. You may not know what thus says the Lord. But all you can tell them is what God has done for you. The Bible says that they are set free by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. If you've ever had to go to court and you're on the witness stand, all you're giving them is your testimony. And if your testimony is true and can prove something that's relevant in that case, then that person can be set free. If your testimony is there, your word of truth can set somebody free. The same is true. When you know who God is and someone is being bound by situations and calamity and bound by the troubles of this world. But when you introduce God to them, your testimony is all they need to be set free from where they are. Can I get a witness? Amen. Number two in your handout. The real evidence of our belief is in our actions. The real evidence is in our action. Verse number 36. For I was hungry, Jesus says. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. How is that, Jesus? We see people on the street and we don't think about Jesus. 
Because they don't look like Jesus. Because Jesus looks like the picture that we have on our wall. He looks like the group picture that they took. You know, the guys were sitting around the table, the 12 of them. That's what Jesus looks like. Was that you outside the convenience store, Jesus? Was that you at the off ramp? Was that you at the bus stop? Was that you outside the church? Outside my place of work? Was that you that I passed by on the freeway? Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. As you've done it to the least of these, he says, now you've done it to me. Let's look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you. This is Jesus' call to ministry. It's also his mission statement. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me or anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now let's look at who Jesus highlights in his mission. First, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. But we get so busy. Busy schedules. I go to hospitals sometime and somebody's sick and I'll visit them. Now, hospitals are not my favorite places to go. So if you're sick, can I, can I show up? No, just kidding. I love you. I go to hospitals and I'm confessing now. And I'll visit the person. I'll speak with them, pray with them, have communion. And then I'll leave. Now, here's a conviction. That was the only sick person on that ward. There were other people who also needed prayer, who needed someone to visit them, who needed someone to make a difference. And I thought about that after I'd left. I said, yes, God. Yes, God. I'll do it next time. Because I've got so much to do. I mean, a pastor's life is busy. I've got so many things on my plate. But God is not going to accept our excuses. We can talk about our agenda, our schedules. We can talk about all the things that's going on in our life. And God, I don't have time for it right now. But God says, I'll make time because I made time for you. Amen. We have to look in our hearts and know that you have the same amount of time, the same hours in a day. And what you do to it, are you going to honor God or are you going to honor yourself? I think we should set aside a little time every day to honor God in the things that we do. The Bible tells us in Matthew, it says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. This is God's words to us. If God wants us to bless those who hate us and say evil to us and do wrong to us, how much more would God want us to bless those that are sick and suffering? and hurting and struggling? Those who have no one to visit them all week? If we want to be children of God and be the hands of God, we'll look out for the poor, the needy, for those who have no one in their life. And we can show them the blessing through God. I'm going to share with you some characteristics between sheep and goats because right now you may be feeling a little goatish. <laughs> First, behavior. Sheep flock together. Sheep have unity. Sheep will stay together. And when you separate sheep, they will find a way to come back together again. They're not going to be driven away by circumstances or by people or situations. If the shepherd tries to divide them, they will find their way back to unity. But a goat is independent. A goat will be with you for a moment, and then you turn around looking for him, and you say, where's Billy? <laughs> Billy goat. Anyway, so... Never there when you need them, but always there when they need you. Goats, never part of the flock, never really was part of it. They're neutral. First ones to depart in a time of situation of trouble. Goats also are stubborn. Sheep are obedient. Goats have hair. Sheep have fleece where they are sheared. And those, that wool can make fine clothing. The diet of sheep are grass, clover. The diet of goats or twigs and vines and paper and trash and garbage. Whatever a goat finds, a goat will eat. Somebody say amen. amen. A sheep is meek. 
Goats are aggressive. Goats are okay as long as things are going their way. You upset a goat and a goat is going to give you trouble. A goat is not easy to forgive. Not easy to make grace again. A goat holds grudges. A goat keeps count of everything that you did wrong. A goat has no sense of unity, no sense of purpose. A goat does not want to bring about something that's going to glorify God. A goat looks out for only number one. Now I'm going to show you a brief little clip of something called fainting goats. This is something that shepherds used many years ago. Most of the animals on this petting farm on Maui, Hawaii are sweet, but nothing too unusual. And then there are the goats. Myotonic goats to be specific. More commonly known as stiff leg goats, wooden leg goats, nervous goats, fainting goats. Fainting goats are indigenous to North America. But that name is a bit of a misnomer because they never lose consciousness when they keel over. If they're startled, a genetic condition causes their muscles to lock up. But it only lasts a few moments and then they're back on their feet. They'll till the next time they're spooked. What happens is the shepherds would place fainting goats among the sheep. And when the wolves would come and attack the sheep, it would startle the goats. When the goats would freeze for that momentary second, the goats became the prey, and the more valuable sheep could escape. Within every church, every organization, there are fainting goats. People who's not going to face the situation, they're going to freeze. They're not going to turn to God and want God to help them through it. They're going to try and seek inwardly how to do things. And if we don't cry out to God, we're going to stay there and be paralyzed with the fear of a situation. If you trust God, you will face that with determination and hope and know that with you and God, all things are possible. Look at number three. I think I'm at number three now. What we do for others demonstrate what we really think about Jesus. What we really think about Jesus. In our church, in many churches, they have a clothing drive. They'll have a food drive. And we'll have, uh, give out turkeys at Thanksgiving. And you hear churches boast about giving out 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 turkeys. They gave out clothing for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. But then I've heard that the homeless eat more than twice a year. They need something after Thanksgiving. They need something in the middle of the year. Something to kind of get them to Thanksgiving. You know, something's got to get you to Thanksgiving. But we feel so good about the drive of doing something. See, God, I I fed the homeless. I fed the hungry, God, just like you told me to do. See, God, 1,500 turkeys, God. But what happens the rest of the year? On your way home, what, what, what happens to that person this week that you see who's hungry? Do you feed that person? Kim likes Tokyo Express and one of, the favorite, one of my favorite places to go. And I used to work near Tokyo Express. And every once in a while, I would get her her favorites. And I would bring them home. And whenever I brought Kim's favorite, I got bonus points. So I would bring Kim's favorite. And I, was, I, I, I got what she wanted. And I was getting off the freeway. And right there at the off-ramp was a homeless person. And I stopped at the light. And you know how we do it. We don't look that way. We... She radio, see what's going on, look over here, it's a nice day out, wonderful, nice time, yeah, I ain't seeing you, I'm not looking at you. I got my bag there, and he's looking at me, he's like, what's in the bag, man? <laughs> Thinking, not my bag, it's my bonus points. Light took forever, longest light ever, and God says, give him the bag. God, these, the God, you know, these, this is spicy, God. Did you know this is spicy? He don't, I don't think he even likes spicy. We ever argue with God like that? When God giving us a clear direction on something to do, and we're arguing about how we're going to do it, you know, God, I, what about next week, God? Well, God, that's all I've got. All I got is five, God. 
You, you open your wallet, God says, give him, give him money. You open your wallet, it says, God, all I got is a five. All I got is a five. God, can he break a five? <laughs> and we bargain with God about how to bless. And when I, I turned down the window and I gave him the bag, he, his face lit up because I think he liked Tokyo Express too. <laughs> a little tear in his eye and there was a little tear in my eye too. And then the light changed. Maybe you're at that place right now where you're waiting for something to change. You're waiting for your light. You're waiting for something to change in your life right now. But there's something that God is compelling you to do that you're not ready to, to let go of. But God, you want things to change right now. And God says the change starts first with you. You want me to change situations. I want to change you so that you can change ultimately the world. But we are there at that light and we're waiting and we're praying and we're hoping, but we won't let go of what God wants us to let go of. That is our struggle. We pray, we believe God. Yes, we love the Lord. We know scripture. We go to church twice a week, but we won't let go and help the poor, the needy, the weak, the sick, the struggling with all of our righteousness. Verse number 37. Then the righteous will answer his saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and came to you? There was a man that was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho once. And he fell among thieves and they beat him and they left him for dead. They left him on the side of the road. He's bleeding. And about that time, a rabbi came by saw the man went on the other side of the road just left church just preached the message just proclaimed the word of God but couldn't live the message that he just preached but then a priest came by same man there he's bleeding he's hurting he's struggling and the priest saw the man I'm certain he looked around and make sure that no one was watching him and he went around the side of the road. But then a Samaritan came by. And a Samaritan was a mixed breed of people. They had no heritage. They were despised. Samaria was a place that everybody didn't like Samaritans. And in fact, if they had to go someplace, they'd go all the way around Samaria rather than going through Samaria. They despised Samaritans that much. This Samaritan didn't have any reason to help anybody. But he went to this man and he picked him up, poured oil on his wounds and bandaged him, took him to the innkeeper, gave him money, keep him here until he gets well. And if there's anything else that I will, oh, I will pay it when I come through again. And Jesus says, which one did the will of the father? Was it the rabbi? No. The priest? No. It was the one who stopped. And looked after the one who could not help himself. Ultimately, God would not measure our theology. You can have degrees all the way. You can have every translation of Bible in your house. You can be a scholar. You can know the word. But that you help somebody as you pass along this way. So that your living could not be in vain. Verse number 40. The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Look at number four, number four in your bulletin. Jesus demands our personal involvement, our personal involvement in caring for others' needs. Don't think that you can just drop off something somewhere. I'll just drop it off at the food bank. Or I'll drop it off at the Goodwill. I'll drop some things off there. And that way the homeless can get it there. Jesus says, when you saw me, you fed me. When you saw me, you gave me something to drink. When you saw me, you clothed me. When you saw me sick, you came and visited me. You're not going to just call the church and say, Pastor, will you pray for my friend who's in trouble? You know, Pastor, this person's in the hospital. We need somebody to help some people over here. But God says, I put it on your heart. You're the hands of God. You're the mouth of God. You're the voice of God. You're the one to make a difference in this world. 
It's easy to delay and let someone else do it. But when we stand in judgment, no one will be able to stand in your place. You will have to stand before God. And you will give account as to what you did while you were here. Verse 41 through verse 46. And then he will say to those on the left side, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not minister to you. Then he would answer to them saying. Assuredly I say to you. And as much as you did not do it. To one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go away. Into everlasting punishment. But the righteous. Into everlasting life. The point. Of this parable. The point of my message is not the who. But the what. The focus of this parable is. We should love every person, serve everyone we can, and this way we glorify God. There's also a warning. Do not believe that you're going to be saved and you'll make it to heaven just because you fed a few homeless folks. Because you clothed a few people. Because you visited someone in prison. Do not believe that it's going to be by your works. The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. What God ultimately wants is a changed heart. I can convict you today and change your mind and you can feel that you need to make a difference. And that will last for maybe two or three days. But if your heart is not changed, the hungry will still be hungry. The naked will still be naked. The sick will still be sick. Ultimately, God wants your heart. It's a changed heart that God wants. And it starts by first you accepting him into your heart. God, come here. And when you open your heart, God says he will come in. That's what he desires to you. He stands at the door, the Bible says, and he knocks. He says, if you would open that door of your heart, I will come in. And God will begin to change things that you can't change. God, we remember our brothers. We remember those right now, God, who struck.